Um, we have heard interesting presentations uh, and all of the speakers have uh, indeed raised uh, important points regarding ad effectiveness. Um, from what we have heard so far, uh, the balance of evidence on average actually points to a positive impact of aid on growth. So we have actually learned something to answer what uh, Sam has raised at the beginning. Uh, the evidence for the most part uh, is based on a research outcome from individual studies. But another way of looking at the ed effect eff effectiveness question is to ask what the accumulated evidence on average will say if we combine all the existing empirical literature in the ed effectiveness area. So this is this basically amounts to doing a regression of regression analysis instead of doing a single uh, study based on one regression analysis. So this is where our meta work uh, comes into picture. This is the meta paper we did with Finn. So the meta analysis method uh, is originally comes from uh, the medicine profession and it's used to quantitatively combine empirical results from a range of studies and get uh, a single effect estimate of interest. Um, I would say if it's implemented with the necessary caution that the method requires, meta-analysis can also be informative in learning from uh, the accumulated evidence regarding ad effectiveness. Um, I should emphasize that, of course, the conclusion of meta-analysis will be only as valid as the care that we would exercise to code and to analyze the data. So having this in mind, um, our meta-analysis from combining 68 aid growth studies also confirms the positive, modest, and yet statistically significant impact of aid on growth, which is emerging in recent years, and which we also have heard from uh, the presentations in this session. Uh, on top of this, our study also shows uh, the importance of taking into account the heterogeneity across countries in terms of the effect of aid uh, on growth. So overall, uh, the positive ed effectiveness stories we have heard today, both in terms of the growth impact and the return of aid investments at the macro level are very much in line with the uncontested positive impact we observe at the micro level. So this basically means that the micro macro paradox uh, is less of an issue for the contemporaneous ed effectiveness debate. Um, but even if these positive assessments enhance our knowledge uh, regarding ed effectiveness, I still believe that more research needs to be done to gain further insight on what works and what should be improved uh, in relation to ed effectiveness. So uh, below, I'll just outline four major areas where we can do better. The first one relates to understanding the channels. As it's, it was uh, mentioned before, we need more research, both quantitative and qualitative, in relation to understanding the mechanisms and the channels as to how aid works, like aid impacts, uh, aid has an impact on growth. Uh, for instance, the health and education outcomes that Sam has already mentioned. It doesn't mean that this work is non-existent. It, it's emerging, but uh, more work will uh, contribute to our understanding in this area. And having an understanding in this area is also crucial to make ed interventions more targeted and focused. And also it will enable us to make some, uh, like to make our expectations reasonable regarding different outcomes. My second point is the need for formulating a slightly different question. The papers presented here uh, today has, uh, have also shown how asking a slightly different question can add more to our knowledge uh, regarding the role of aid in development. For instance, the presentation uh, we heard from Henrik this afternoon and also the other outcomes that Sam was uh, referring to, they are a step in the right direction. Um, we have heard that uh, investment on aid has a high return, but we still need to know more, for instance, like what the implication of this for uh, long run productivity and the impact of aid on sectoral productivities like on agriculture and manufacturing as well. Um, and moving to my third point, and as it's already em emphasized by the previous speakers, we really need to understand the heterogeneity and we need 
to be cautious uh, in using case by case analysis because in the aid effectiveness literature, it's already acknowledged both on uh, individual studies and from the meta analysts as well. There is an in inherent heterogeneity in the impact of aid on growth, both across countries and over time as well. So this certainly points to the need for country by country analysis. But I believe that this is very helpful, like in terms of giving a specific policy recommendation. But we have to consider this analysis as not as a substitute, but rather as a supplement for the ongoing aggregate level uh, ed effectiveness studies. Um, the reason is that it's already pointed out that there are some difficulties of like making generalization. Also, we also have a problem of quality data and consistent data across the different source. So keeping this in mind, we have to be cautious about making inference from uh, these studies. And finally, we also need uh, some research on what uh, aid effectiveness requires from donors, donor side. As Sam already points out in his conclusion, donor action is actually uh, important. Uh, in particular, donor coordination and need assessment is uh, crucial in terms of making aid more effective. And also, uh, predictability in aid flows is another aspect of the effectiveness uh, debate. If the flows are unpredictable and volatile, that will create a challenge on fiscal planning. And the last but not least is uh, the importance of engaging recipients throughout the process, including in the planning, implementation, and performance evaluations. Just to borrow the saying from Oliver, it's uh, recipient behavior requires recipient perspective. So it's important to, to engage them throughout the process. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this uh, nice We have 15 minutes for the question and answer from the floor. Uh, question from the floor and answer from the panel. Who wants to take the floor? On Adrian. On Bixton. On Bixton, University of Gothenburg. Uh, yeah, those was quite interesting presentations. You talked about, about the quantitative impacts or impacts of quantities. Uh, I wonder if or what we know about the impact of different forms of modalities of aid. A mechanism was uh, touched upon by uh, Oliver, of course, but does it matter how we deliver the aid? I think it's quite important, and it's much harder maybe to figure out whether projects or budget support or whatever form it's transferred, how that affects the effectiveness. Because we're also interested in what aid does to the institutions and how they handle the aid when it comes in. And the way it's transferred is, I think, very important. I'm not sure what we know about the quantitative consequences of the choice of modalities. So whatever you know about this, I would be interested in hearing. Good. Thank you, Adrian Wood. Thank you for three very stimulating presentations and some excellent comments, including by the chair. Um, I'd like to, in a way, suggest to, to, to Sam that he write a different paper, that his question be, how much has our research helped policymakers? And that really, it's, you take the same material and you rejig it in a completely different framework. Now, of course, there are different policymakers in different places, but let me just put it to you from the perspective of an ex-chief economist of an aid agency. Um, what, what, we'd like to, what I would like to know is three things. Um, how can I justify the total amount of aid that's being given to the particular set of countries that our country has already decided it's going to allocate its aid to? How can I argue, as it were, with the Ministry of Finance, the Treasury, about the aggregate amount of aid? Second thing I want to know is, how should we allocate this aid among these countries? How much should each, how, how, how should it be shared out uh, among the countries? Third question is, how should we use the aid within each country, and how should that vary with the characteristics of the country? And those are the three questions, the three key questions that I, as it were, had to grapple with the whole time. 
And I think that your research does shed light on that. But I think it'd be very helpful if you, as it were, re-articulated what you've learned in that light. And I address it to you, but in a way the comments apply absolutely um, <clears throat> to, to Henrik and to Oliver as well. Thank you very much. Uh, on this side, Madame. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for all the speakers for excellent presentations. My name is Kristina Kuvaja. I'm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. I would have a question to Sam. Um, you said in your concluding remarks that donor behavior is critical within the framework of international agreements and commitments. Now, from the evidence that you have looked at, would you be able to elaborate any key elements of what um, what elements of donor behavior would be critical for effectiveness of aid? Thank you. Thank you. Just one question here. And please. Please, can you give your name? Hi. Pibi Anand from University of Bradford. Uh, my question is to Oliver. Um, thank you for bringing out some very important insights about the choice of indicators. Um, if I may just request you to elaborate a little bit more on two points. One, I do much of my work on country case studies, so I am um, sad that my career is doomed. But <laughs> how, how we can learn from yeah, country case studies to um, uh, make judgments about quality of data. And second one is um, many of your graphs show some degree of convergence or similarity in movement. So as long as one is not mixing up between two different indicators, is the broader picture of conclusion going to be very significantly different? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Three, three excellent presentate four excellent five excellent presentations uh, my question is to Oliver in in addition to all the complications of measurement uh, I think there is a further one if you do as you suggest uh, sometimes try to adopt the perspective of the recipient and use recipient data uh, recipient uh, governments frequently have no idea how much aid is actually flowing into their country. It does not all come through the government budget. In fact, the percentage that comes through the government budget is sometimes in the order of 35 to 40 percent. Uh, that's a huge difference uh, when you're, you're trying to find uh, aggregate effects uh, from, from aid flows from the perspective of the recipient. And uh, I, I, I think that simply has to be factored in. And go donors as yet, uh, although they have promised, uh, have not succeeded in providing data which is usable for recipient governments about the size of actual flows uh, to their country emanating from donor sources. And that includes NGOs as well as, as governmental sources. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was very intriguing indeed, but it leaves me with the question, what is aid supposed to finance, that is, what is the market imperfection we're trying to address? And partial answer was um, very clear in Henrik's presentation. It's a particular type of capital, infrastructure, education, whatever it is, and aid makes it possible to finance that because you don't have the, the uh, possibility for taxation and, and apparently there's a uh, international capital market imperfection. That's the familiar case for Aid. It could have been phrased, not in the same words, like that at the beginning of aid in the 1950s. People were very much thinking in those terms, and I think the evidence which you've now got is supporting that case. 
Um, now, let me go back to uh, Patrick Guillemot's very interesting introduction. Um, he very modestly referred to his own work, but I want to highlight that a little bit because that is a very different point. So what comes out of uh, Patrick's work is that aid seems to be um, particularly effective in one group of countries which he calls vulnerable countries. And we, we can argue about what exactly vulnerability is, but it seems to me a completely different type of case for aid. So my question to the panel is, okay, effective or not, what is it supposed to be financing? I'm, I'm still not quite clear on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Samuel Wangwe from Tanzania. I just wanted to, first of all, there are great presentations. I have uh, learned a lot in the process. But there are two questions which I uh, would have liked to to, to, to hear, which are actually dominant in the current debate in aid. Uh, one is the politics of aid, both from the recipient side and from the uh, donor side. What politics is driving the, 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 the process? Uh, so I wonder whether from the insights you have uh, uh, gathered, uh, whether there are any issues you can throw in that regard. Uh, secondly, is the a challenging question of governance as a conditionality, uh, especially, and that's some one of the big differences between uh, aid from the OECD and aid from, uh, uh, say, China and uh, uh, other uh, more recent uh, uh, sources. Uh, is it influencing? The, the way uh, OECD aid is behaving. Because with governance, the, the challenge we are facing is it's extremely unpredictable. Uh, a big story in the newspaper is enough to cut aid, suddenly without notice. Uh, so the message conveyed is uh, if there are governance problems, hide them. Don't let them come out in the newspapers. Because, uh, the donors will immediately cut until you explain. So this uh, how to handle governance in a more predictable way uh, seems to be a continuously problematic issue uh, in the pre pre predictability of aid. And after all, uh, there are big questions of whether it really influences the quality of governance anyway. So if there are any reflections in that regard. Two last and short questions. Just here, and the last one for Richard. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Peter Quarte from University of Ghana. Uh, I've listened to great presentations, um, but I just want to throw this to Oliver, uh, your point about case studies. I think that's the norm. Uh, journals don't really appreciate uh, case studies. But then if you Look at Easterly's book on the white man's burden. He says, we spend too much time planning. We look at the big picture. Whereas the way forward is to look at small projects, small case studies. And that is where the, all the nuances of um, aid, uh, effectiveness uh, comes to play. So I think perhaps uh, we, we have to uh, critically take a look at this. Um, our journals for academic work, or they are meant to inform and also inform policy. Thank you. Thank you. And last question, a remark from a postdoc remark, Richard Carré. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, Richard Carey. Uh, I was with the Development Assistance Committee for 30 years, so I've been thinking about these issues for a long time. And thank you for uh, very, very interesting contributions. And Oliver, I'm involved at the moment in a set of country case studies in Africa on the management of external resource flows. So all of your material, very, very interesting to us. Now, um, the remark was made that aid will not transform a developing country. Only a developmental state will do that. That's what Joe Stiglitz 
told us uh, this morning. But um, what was coming up uh, this afternoon was the, the macro-micro paradox. Nobody really asked the question, what about illicit flows? And that illicit flows are on the agenda now of the G20. And uh, is this um, really something that needs to be much more factored into the kind of analysis that uh, you've been doing? If we look at the Lewis, uh, the Lucas paradox, which Justin Lin brought up yesterday, uh, Robert Lucas in 1990 was saying, why doesn't capital flow from rich countries to poor countries? He said that uh, rents are captured by elites in the south and recycled to the north, just as they used to be in the colonial period. And this is uh, really uh, what happens in the world. And the remedy to that that he gave was bring in foreign direct investment to break the grip of the elites and invest in human capital. And then eventually you will get onto a developmental uh, track. So, uh, and then in a country like that, there is also no learning by doing process. So you have this uh, capital outflow that is uh, really helping to explain, I think, the macro-micro paradox. And finally, on, on has there been damage to institutions from the aid industry? And I think that there has been damage to institutions. Uh, the aid industry has been fragmented, low predictability, high transactions costs, etc. And those issues were addressed by the whole series of high-level forums from Rome, Paris, Accra to Busan with some success but the whole issue is that the aid industry isn't good at helping to produce systemic outcomes because it's very fragmented and that's a really a very a big challenge for us. So thank you again very much for these uh, contributions. Thank you. We have a few minutes for each panelist to, to react and answer with so many very interesting and relevant questions. Uh, Sam, you begin? Okay, we keep, sure. We keep the same order. Okay. Um, okay. Th thank you very much. Uh, um, a large number of very interesting uh, questions, and uh, let me apologise in advance if I don't answer individuals specifically. I think that's going to be impossible. So just to, uh, I think, starting with uh, Adrian uh, Wood's comments, how can we reformulate some of the lessons to be more policy useful? And of course, the the danger is it's very difficult to go from uh, aggregate average. Um, coefficients, if you will, to what should I do for a specific country? Uh, and, and, and I think that's always, that's always a dangerous leap to make only on the basis of the kind of evidence that, that is available from these studies. So of course, you know, there is other forms of evidence that one must use. But even so, let me, let me suggest perhaps a, a way forward. So a way forward um, with respect to at least total aid volumes and allocations of aid could be more based on rates of return. So what kind uh, of um, what kinds of costs um, are countries facing when they go to to raise commercial debt for long periods of time? Can they access these kinds of uh, vehicles, and at what cost? And I think that's a starting point for having a sensible conversation about the need for concessional financing to specific kinds of countries. And uh, I mean, for example, large developing or large emerging markets. Um, often, uh, at least when they're growing uh, stably over periods of time, can access commercial debt on quite reasonable terms over long periods, at long durations, uh, whereas a South Sudan might not be able to. So that, uh, that, that, that's an important starting point for, I think, the aid allocation discussion. Um, how should we use aid in individual countries? Well, if we take seriously the issue of long-run um, outcomes, well, I think that's the place to start. Um, aid, I think there's probably good evidence or the best evidence of aid effectiveness is in uh, contributing to accumulation of human capital uh, over long run, so providing public goods, uh, as well as in infrastructure. So these are, again, all the things that, that, that sensible governments ideally should be doing uh, and doing more of. Um, so again, that might perhaps provide a, a, a starting point. Uh, that links a little bit to uh, um, the question of what is aid trying to finance, and well, perhaps for, you know, forgive me for being boring, but I think it is accumulation of uh, these critical, the critical infrastructure to development, human, uh, physical, and institutional. 
With respect to um, the questions around donor behavior, um, there's at least, well, there, there's three main, the three C's of donor behavior. I mean, one is donor coordination. Um, are donors um, significantly or, or meaningfully coordinating their behavior in a given country? Um, there's there's quite a lot of reasonable evidence that donor fragmentation, donor fractionalization, donor conflict reduces aid effectiveness. Um, so this links to Arnie's question about modalities. So modalities of aid that support donor coordination, sectoral uh, instruments, budget support instruments, um, I think should be preferred as a starting point, as a point of departure. The evidence for this is, is not so much. I'll be quick, sorry. The evidence, uh, the evidence of, of the differential effectiveness of these kinds of instruments isn't as good as we would like, partly because they've only really been operating for the last 10 years, uh, if that, and inconsistently across different countries. Um, I believe there was actually a poster session paper yesterday that was looking at budget support uh, to the health sector in Malawi. So that might be a, a one to look at. Um, the, the, the other two Cs, credibility, uh, in partnerships and, and developing a conversation and consistency in donor behavior. So I think those are kind of the three C's. I'll stop there. Sorry, and apologies to the other Thank ones. You, <laughs> Knowing that Oliver got a lot of good questions, I'll be very brief. Uh, let me just quickly address the, uh, Anna and Adrian had this uh, modalities, uh, justification and allocation. I think justification, I mean, this panel, I mean, if you imagine you would have Easterly, Esther Duflo, and, and Anindya Banerjee uh, sitting here, it would have been another session, right? <laughs> and it would have been more micro-ish. And, and probably some of what you need could be micro-ish. So I think what you get from this panel and this research is the justification in, in the sense that if we can, if there is an overall positive return to, to foreign aid, that could justify in your constituency that we actually spend the money. And I think. Being from Denmark, I can tell you that our aid budget is under pressure, huge pressure. I think that goes for all Scandinavian countries. We had the Finnish uh, president here this morning, also under pressure, right? So, so in that sense, our work is for the Northland in that case, right? And when it comes to, to allocation, I was, I was so happy watching O'Connell yesterday, right? Because you, you would see that USAID are doing more or less as I get DFID is doing, as, as Danita is doing this, um, growth diagnostics, uh, surveys, and a lot of microanalysis because that's your job. Specialization is important. Our job in this case is the justification, and you can look at all these models for the needs, if you like. What are the needs? And that will be based on different models. And, and they have been derived. And, it, it, and, and as I said, another panel would be explaining uh, how you could use these. Um, for the donor behavior, I fully support Sam. If I, uh, for, for, for Richard Carey, um, I think in, in this group, what you should do is actually also approach IMF. As far as I know, IMF changed their balance of payment statistics so we can no longer identify the state to state transfers, which is a huge problem because one nice addition to the aid flows that Oliver are going to talk about are state to state transfers we can find or could find in balance of payment statistics. And I've been looking at these and they're much, much lower than the aid flows, uh, of course, right? But, but this is one new source or different source of, of information, but we cannot find it with the new uh, definitions. Thank you. Thank you. Henrik, uh, Oliver. Wow. That's it. Uh, right, well, more questions, uh, answering all of those questions will be longer than the presentation. Um, so thanks for very stimulating sent questions. I'll try to use Adrian's three questions as a framework to hopefully comment on, on all of the questions uh, to some extent. Uh, but the first thing I would say to the minister is that, look, one thing you've got to be aware of, whatever you do, there will be one constituency, and perhaps you can identify the newspapers. In the UK, you certainly can. There'll be one consistency, constituency that is against aid. Doesn't matter what you do, they're going to be against it. There'll be another constituency, civil society, NGOs, that will probably be for it. So you know, recognize that whatever you do, that's the world out there. And you might want to preempt that. Um, but then you say, right, 
how can you justify aid to countries? He said, well, you know, look, on balance, it makes them better off. They're better off with aid than they are without it. Now, you have to introduce an important distinction here, which, which comes into many of the, the questions, is you've got to think of one set of countries where it's, it's a crisis, it's an emergency, it's fragile, it's vulnerable. Um, the, the, the mechanics of aid, the arguments for aid are very different in those situations than in a situation where it's continued to support to a particular government. So you get to, and I think you, know, you have to make these different arguments. I'm going to focus on the ones where it's continued support to a particular government. So how should you allocate it? Well, basically, you should do what you probably have been doing, is concentrate on those countries where you've developed a relationship of trust, where you think, yeah, look, I can get on with these, I can relate to these, I understand where they're coming from. Yes, I know there's elite capture, there are illicit flows, but, you know, I know that's the case, but I think these guys are basically okay. Um, has the aid industry damaged the institutions in these countries? Uh, I don't know if it's damaged them. I think up until certainly the 1990s, the lack of coordination of donors and the proliferation of different donors with different requirements, all wanting to meet um, the officials, that was a huge burden on those countries. Now, I think that has improved, not as much as it should have, and that's the donor's fault. They, they have lots of meetings about coordination, but they never actually do very much um, in any countries. And that's partly because each donor wants to be able to have a flagship for its aid. Donors are, the donor policymaker or politician is often not really that concerned about does aid work, it's does our aid work. Um, and that's a different question, somewhat. Um, but does it influence governance? And that, I think, I think there is some evidence that yes, it does influence governance if the government thinks that the donors will actually respond to changes in governance. So if they think that improvements in institutions or democratization will get, lead to more aid or more predictable aid, they will be motivated to change. If they think it doesn't matter, the donors aren't going to punish us, then they won't respond. That relates to this issue of convergence. Um, yes, there is, conver there is probably a lot of convergence in the data because for a number of things. First of all, data collection has improved in all of these countries. And, and aid, has, aid has played a role in that. Aid has played a role in, in investing and improving um, the ability to collect data. There's a greater international standardization of how you measure, how you collect things. Computerization at customs has greatly improved trade data, tax data. Um, so, yes, over the last 10 to 15 years, there have been significant improvements. There have also been improvements in public financial management, in um, policy, macro policy that we heard in one of the sessions. And aid and donors have all played a role in that. So, yes, over the last 10, 15 years, there have been these impro improvements. And I think you want to emphasize those to the policymaker. You know, these, these are not, you may not pick these up in GDP, but these are really important. They're probably far more important than something you might pick up in GDP. So, you know, you can, and as we heard from the session yesterday, you always, you can put the positive spin on it. So you pick the examples that work, but there are a lot of them. Um, and often the, the cases that haven't worked, there are reasons for it. Um, just to comment on Jerry's point, yes, you know, that is, particularly if you want to do time series country studies, uh, and particularly if you want to look at, you know, the donors, yes, recently the donors are trying to get better measures of the aid that goes to, to the, the country. But you might have that for 10, 15 years. That's no good if you want to do a time series country study. You need 30 to 40 years. Uh, and it's almost, in, it's really difficult to get reliable, consistent aid data going back. And some countries are better than others. So in Tanzania and Kenya, we were actually able through... Um, government statistics or budget statistics to go back and get a measure of the aid they record as having received. Um, uh, but in Uganda and Ghana, we haven't been able to do that because we just couldn't find that data. 
So it differs from country to country. So then the final one, how should I deliver it? I would say general budget support if possible. What you're trying to finance is, is public goods and services. Um, if that's not what you're trying to finance, why are you calling it aid? You know, that's the aim. Um, and the reason you're doing it is because you think the circumstances in this country is that at the moment their ability to collect domestic revenue is insufficient to finance their expenditure needs. So that's you're filling that gap. That is the justification. If that's what you believe and if you trust the country, give them general budget support. Um, because that's much more efficient from the recipient's perspective. Now, some donors don't like that because, well, then it's not our project and we can't put a plaque on it and we can't sell it to our constituency. Well, tough. If what you really want to do is help this country and you trust them, give them general budget support. Thank you. As a conclusion, one uh, short remarks about the data. Uh, Nothing has been uh, reflected in the discussion about the new measurement of ODA by, agreed by the DAC. And uh, there may be uh, some uh, prospects for new uh, uh, analysis and uh, measurement of effectiveness with the total effective support. I think uh, uh, the, there is a new field of research due to the better definitions maybe of uh, ODA and more even more than ODA, the total official support for development. Uh, my uh, last remark will be uh, to refer to the uh, Adrian Wood uh, topic. This was uh, your first answer. Uh, I feel at the end of this discussion that there is still a large gap between the uh, research on aid effectiveness and the support to policy analysis. Uh, because uh, when uh, you raise the question of the allocation between countries, uh, of course uh, you need to have uh, uh, some consideration of justice, of equity, but also, and it was very important from the donor point of view, uh, on effectiveness. And if we have no empirical grounds to assess the effectiveness of the different countries uh, from the research analysis, we are a little embarrassed to uh, to, to, to link the research uh, with uh, policy advice. And it's very clear uh, in uh, the debate which has been developed uh, uh, among the multilateral development banks during the last 15 years about the PBA, uh, performance-based allocation, and its reform. Uh, at the beginning, it was supported by uh, the dollar bond side uh, analysis that aid was more effective in countries with better governance and has been what, what was wrong in the substance, <laughs> but uh, what was interesting as a way to raise the question of the heterogeneity of the effects um, depending on the sp some specific characteristic of the country. The characteristics uh, involved were not maybe the most relevant, but some other are relevant and they are been, they are to be investigated to uh, uh, give some indication about where uh, the funds are the more uh, effective, not only distributed among, according to, to equity and justice, but also according to effectiveness. And I am impressed by the, uh, I, I agree with Oliver saying, uh, we have so many particular cases, the fragility and so on. But uh, if uh, you are a multilateral institution, you need uh, general rules. And uh, the present state is, uh, we have a general rule. It's a PBA, some kind of PBA, but uh, since it's not applicable, you multiply the exceptions and uh, there are so many exceptions, and especially for fragility, that the rule is applied to a minority of countries. So it's not, no longer a rule. And for that, we need some uh, uh, good indication from the research. And that's the reason why I raised at the beginning the issue of heterogeneity. So that's only for say that the wonderful research which has been done here about aid effectiveness is not the final point and there is still work to do for the researcher about aid effectiveness. Thank you.